Computer. Yes. Right. I was going to say no problem this time because we are going to speak about graphics. So uh, let's move now. Uh, Anne is going to speak about a specific project, which is Video for Linux, and uh, is one of the maintainer. So I'll let him speak. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hans Verkel. I work for Cisco Systems in Norway, and I am one of the Video for Linux co-maintainers. I think we have something like six or seven co-maintainers. It's a uh, uh, after networking, it's the biggest subsystem in the kernel. So we see a lot of stuff, especially from all the smartphones manufacturers. You know, be before smartphones started to become important, uh, basically video for Linux developers, they were weird people who wanted to watch TV on their PC. And they reverse engineered all sorts of stuff to make it work. But with the upcoming embedded world starting to use Linux, your smartphones, suddenly everything is running Linux and they needed video capture and it's become, uh, you can see that a heck of a lot of money went into this subsystem to make it work. It really went out of the hobbyist sphere into professional world. And that's where I'm, Cisco is making video conferencing equipment and that's where the video capture comes in. Uh, one of the big problems with video for Linux, video is complicated. Uh, so you get complicated drivers, you get complicated applications, and what is what has been missing for a very long time is ways to test it. We had all the we had beautiful APIs, we had it documented, but how do you know that when you write a driver that it's actually doing the right things, or when you write an application that it will work with a slightly different device and what you are testing with. Um, so my talk here is basically about what is the ecosystem surrounding video for Linux. And here's a list of utilities that we have. Uh, at the end there will be a slide with resources, so don't worry about that. FIFA 2 compliance, that's an important one that deals with compliance testing. And the next slide we'll talk about that a lot more. We have a command line tool, VFRL2 CTL, which is basically the Swiss army knife for video for Linux. It allows you to control almost every aspect of a driver using just that command line tool. QVFRL2, that is basically the GUI variant of the command line tool, uh, is video, so it's a lot easier to see it in a GUI than just see some results on the command line. We have a small debug tool, which is basically a front end for a few debug IOCTOs. Uh, its, its primary use is during development, when you want to change registers in chips on the fly. And it's very useful to do that. Uh, because you're changing hardware, you need root permission in order to run it. We have some support for core debugging. Quite often it's very useful. You run an application and it's failing. So what does the application actually do? and you can debug that quite easily. And finally, something I did uh, about uh, six weeks, six, eight weeks ago. Uh, if you have, uh, Valgrind is a very useful tool to test whether everything is initialized in structures and whether you have memory leaks. And I added support to that for video for Linux. So Valgrind 3.10, it's out one or two weeks. That will have the support for that. So the first part that I want to talk about is testing drivers. Drivers are complicated, uh, and this tool was made to test the compliance of driver code with the Video for Linux API. I think I started it six years ago. It used to be very tiny, but whenever I had some time, I started adding more and more and more stuff to it. And at the beginning of this year, the big step was taken to also have support for actual streaming. I mean, what's the whole point of Video for Linux? It's to get video, to stream video. So being able to actually do compliance testing on streaming was a very big step. Uh, and in fact, today, if you want to get a new driver into the kernel, the first thing I will ask is, okay, did you run Video for L2 compliance over it? And what are the results? And did you fix any failures there? So it's actually a requirement for getting into the kernel. Uh, there are roughly 900 tests at this moment that are being executed. 
by the by the utility, and it covers about 90% of all the IOCTOS. We have 82. It's a pretty big number. And we cover everything. The main ones that are missing at the moment is cropping and selection and some obscure overlay IOCTOS and there is a new one that I haven't added code for yet. Cropping and selection, I, I've worked on that already, so I'm actually hoping that perhaps this year I can get it in. What's important to know is that actually the compliance test is more strict than the video for Linux specification, because it's not only testing whether you comply to the specification, it is also testing whether you comply to the latest core frameworks for video for Linux. If you get a new driver in, you should use those new frameworks. And one of the easiest way of checking that is just running this tool because it will fail if you don't use them. Uh, doing everything manually is very complicated if you, if you want, don't want to use the core framework. Uh, the core framework takes, takes a lot of work out of your hands and makes things a lot easier. So this is also a nice test to see whether you're actually using those core frameworks. Obviously, if you want to submit a new driver, you have to use them. And there is enough documentation out there, or just ask on the mailing list, and we will be perfectly happy to, to, to help. What we want to avoid is that you give us a new driver using all the old shit, and then we have to say, no, that's not going in, because you're not using all this fancy, beautiful stuff that makes your driver half the size, uh, which is demotivating for you and for us. So if you start to work on a new driver and you're not sure what you want, what, how you have to do it, contact us. We're happy to, we're not going to write the code for you. That's your job. But we can definitely help you out in how to do it, what is, what is good example code, where can you find all the documentation, etc. Um, v for all to compliance is a moving target. So as I said, every so often I add new stuff. So never use the version that you get from a distribution. Always compile yourself from scratch from the repository so you have the latest code. So I have, of course, I have to do. So it's very easy. So there's a webcam in here. And I just run it. That's it. All you have to do. As you can see, let me make this a bit bigger. Is this readable or should it be bigger? All right. There we go. Last line, four fails. So this is uh, the webcam is a UVC driver, one of the most common ones. Unfortunately, it still has errors. And, but let's just start from the top. So the output, it starts out with driver info. So what driver is being used, UVC video, name of the cards, you know, what driver version are you using, capabilities. Um, then you get this line, compliance test for device video zero, not using lib v4l2. So that needs a little bit of explanation. A uh, user space library was created, lib v4l2, very creatively named. And the purpose of that one was to support all sorts of weird formats. So lots, particularly in the early days, lots of webcams, they have their own proprietary protocol. They did their own proprietary uh, uh, formatting of the video. And what you don't want to have is that every application has to do 1,000 different formats uh, and convert them into something that they understand. So this library was created, and if you use a library in your application, it will do, magically will do the conversion for you. So there are three or four standard uh, common formats that it supports, and anything that's not in that list as proprieties will convert to that. Most applications, uh, should use this library. But for compliance testing, you want to test directly on the driver. So by default, it's not using the wrapper library, but you can give it an option and then it will use the library instead of going directly to the driver. Unfortunately, there are actually still some issues in the driver that makes it not quite compliant with the spec, which you almost never will see. But as I said, this is a really strict compliance test. It's, I'm really trying to do a very good job here. So there are some failures here at the start about the capability. Um, actually, uh, that's fairly harmless. It should be added. One problem with UVC is that it's actually not using some of the core frameworks that it should. Uh, this is something, a uh, patch to correct most of that has been posted, but it's not yet included. 
and this message will go away once it switches to two steps. Again, a reason why you should use all the core frameworks because they, they deal with stuff like this. So I, I, it's sort of grouped in various categories, uh, some required IOCTOs, or just one. Uh, can you support multiple opens at the same time? Debug IOCTOs, uh, things dealing with inputs, outputs, configuration. And then for every input or output, it will test various other things. Now, in this case, there are some issues with controls. Again, UVC is not using the control framework um, for somewhat good reasons, mostly because using it, UVC is dependent on the hardware for what controls it supports. It's different from most other drivers where the driver creates the controls. So it's it's a bit more complicated than UVC, uh, but so it's, it's doing most of it manually, but it's not entirely complete yet. So there are some issues here that should be fixed. Um, but this is without streaming. So if we want to do streaming, I need to add the minus S flag. Unfortunately, it, spe it uh, spectacularly fails on it. I'm not entirely sure why that is. And the bigger problem, if I want to stream again, this is all I get. And I have to reload the driver to make it work. So there is something really screwy in this driver that messes things up, which is bad because this is one of the most popular ones there is. Again, I'm not sure what the compliance test does to make this happen. And I think it's all related again because the dead driver doesn't use some of the core frameworks and is doing things itself. And I never trust, I never trust a driver that tries to do it itself. Because I know I can't write a driver that does it itself and make it correct. So why would anyone else? It takes a long time to get core frameworks to do really the, the, the right things. And a lot of people look at that. So I think that that's one of the main things I can can give you if you're developing a driver, use the frameworks. They're there for a reason. A lot of work went into them because we didn't have them. Six years, six, seven years ago, we didn't have them. And that made it really difficult to develop these drivers. But now it's, you know, all the complexity left in the video of Linux drivers is your hardware, which is bad enough. I've seen, you know, looking at how hardware designers, uh, what they come up with, that is, spectacular sometimes how complex they make it. So you'll be busy enough just supporting your hardware. And the framework tries to take all the the common stuff out of the way, the administrative stuff, so that you can concentrate on what is really important. Um, and to see how it should go. So this is one driver that works perfectly. And I will get to that later. So this will just this is the visual driver that we will discuss later. Has a huge number of options and capabilities, and this is how it should be. Zero warnings, zero failures. Oh, not the streaming. So, now it's streaming. That's how it should be. So the other tools, uh, the, two co the command line tool and the graphics tool, they are sort of golden reference utilities. So if you're writing an application and don't quite know how to do something, you can look in that source code. Um, these utilities, they are kept in sync with the kernel. As soon as a new feature is added, the utilities will be updated to support it. And the command line tool, it's ideal for testing embedded systems. The graphics tool is ideal for uh, if you have a proper graphics environment running. And I will show those as well. So the number of options since the command line tool supports pretty much everything, the number of options is huge. So I have actually help sections for different topics if you want to see it all, help all, then this is what you get. But the good thing is it really supports almost everything that we have in video of Linux. So this is a great tool to 
to test various scenarios from a command line to do scripting. Um, most interesting, I think, often is the stream help. So you can very easily just say uh, stream mmap or stream user and then you start streaming for a certain number of frames or indefinitely or you skip X many uh, number of frames. You can stream to a file or from a file for a video output. You have lots of options here. There is a complete uh, pattern generator built in, test pattern generator for video outputs. I will come back to that later. So you have pretty much everything that you need is in this utility. But in practice, what you use on a system, on a laptop or a PC-like environment oh, is, well, let me reload the UVC driver. QV for 2 is the more, um, oh, hi everyone, is the more common driver that is uh, much easier to use. And it has, so one thing that I want to point out, so you have a general setting step that this is gen that the, the program comes up with, that tells you which input to use, the formats to, to, to use. But the control step after that, they show controls that the driver provides. And so the application has no knowledge of what it is. It just generates those steps based on information from the driver. It has no idea what it means. It is us that see, hey, this is a brightness control, so this probably controls brightness of the image. So it's important to keep that distinction, especially for later on in this presentation. And while well, this, is, this is basically... Uh, uh, the same same thing as the command line tool, except with a proper GUI, makes it much easier to uh, to support. So you can easily make me the Hulk, or should be a Smurf. Yeah, there it was, greenish, bluish Smurf. All the usual stuff that you can expect, you can, can control through this. So these are command line tools, GUI tools. Um, They're very easy to install. They do pretty much everything that you want. And the next topic is, or this deals with basically VFRL2 compliance, deals with testing your drive. The tools that I showed you are how you can test drivers. The next step is, okay, how the, how the hell do I test my application? So what is typically happens, so you, you have a, you buy a webcam and you want to make a nice application for a Skype-like competitor, whatever. So you make your application, but you make it for your, your hardware that you have. But how do you know that uh, there isn't a, another webcam that will work as well with your hardware? with your application. So there are a number of ways you can do it. One of them is to be like me, which is that you go out on eBay, you get donations, you buy stuff, and you get drawers full of all sorts of weird and wonderful hardware. And then you buy some more uh, test signal generators, DVB signal generators, PCI. Well, basically, you, you pay a lot of money, and it takes a lot of time to be able to test all that shit. But that's not something most people can do. I mean, I've been at this for, when did I start? 10, 11 years ago. Uh, usually you want your application released not in 10 years, but say in one or two months. So we have, uh, what we did is to make uh, test drivers, virtual drivers that emulate hardware. Uh, VV is the one that is currently in the kernel. Unfortunately, it is crap because it does not actually emulate real existing hardware. What it does is non-standard, and that makes it useless. I mean, I've tried it with Skype. What you end up with is sort of a, a webcam window that is very not narrow and very tall. I don't know what is happening there with VV. It, it's not a good driver to use. 
Um, one thing that is available today is uh, mem to mem test dev that is specifically for memory to memory devices like the interlaces, codecs. Uh, generally out of scope for most, say, a Skype-like application. So what we did uh, for 3.18, it's actually merged, and will once the merge window for 3.18 begins, it will get into the kernel, is the Vivid driver, which is a VV replacement. And that one actually supports video capture, video output, vertical blanking capture and output, so that's the part where you get things like teletext, uh, it also supports radio receivers and transmitters. Video for Linux does radio as well, which is basically a TV tuner without the video. And it even has uh, software-defined radio capture, which is brand new. And this really emulates very closely what real hardware does. It should be indistinguishable from an actual board that you buy, the way it behaves. So this allows you, as an application writer, to just load this driver and you see, does it work with it? Does it do everything? Can it support everything that that driver provides you? <clears throat> so, here it is. Uh, I run, sorry, need to reload it. I ran the compliance test and it leaves it in an inconsistent state. Yeah, that's better. So this is what it starts off with initially. Just a simple color bar, nothing special. But looking here, you actually have various inputs, so webcam, TV, S-video, and HDMI to choose from, so that is all emulated by the driver. Uh, in this case, it starts up as a webcam, so you typically have a frame size that you can select. And just as like a real driver, when you go to a higher frame size, the maximum frame rate will drop. So for the highest, it's maximum 15 frames per second. For the lowest, you can do 60 frames per second. So this is typically what a real webcam will do as well, because it's limited by bandwidth. So higher resolution means something else has to give. And it has the usual uh, controls. So there are user controls here. And they actually work. So if I can, I can use the brightness, and that will effectively change it correctly. So the whole lot uh, works. Um, you also see a whole bunch of uh, uh, alpha components no, uh, from button on. So these, all these, they are actually all the different controls, different control types that are supported by video for Linux. Uh, since the controls come from the driver as, a driver, as an application developer, you never know what controls to expect. So it's good to have this test driver so you can see, can see if your application supports all the various types. These, these ones are always provided. They don't do anything special, but they are just there to allow you to test your application. Can I handle all these types? Um, so, user, so again, remember all the tabs named controls, they come from the driver. And the last one, Vivid Controls, is actually controls that um, control the test pattern generator. So inside this virtual driver, it's generating all these images on the fly. And you want to be able to control that. So one of the first things that you want to do is actually uh, color bar, uh, so horizontal color bar, different test patterns. So we have primary colors, <coughs> squares, one by one squares, or alternating horizontal lines, vertical, it's probably yeah, you can't see that obviously on this. Uh, also, uh, crosshairs, this is ideal for testing scalars. Gray ramp and uh, static pattern. So these are also all available. Uh, there is some, as you can see, some on-screen display text. Oh. So you can move to just the counter or leave it out completely. 
you can give it movement. Usually it's much easier to, to test things if things are actually moving. That, that especially that way you know that things are changing, that you're not just seeing the last uh, image and it's just hanging there. You can draw a border. Let me make a magnifier. So you will see a two-line border around the image. You might wonder what's the point in that, but if you take this image in your application, you want to see that you're actually getting all the active video and you're not cutting anything off. Particularly if you get into scaling issues and you get letterboxing or pillar boxing and your application wants to get rid of the pillar boxing, you want to make sure you're just getting rid of the black bars and not anything else. So having an exact two pixel border around it makes it very easy to check that you're doing that right. The other thing is a green square. Is it actually, I can't see it from here. Is it, is it really square on that screen? It should be. This is ideal for testing pixel aspect ratio issues. So normally for a webcam, the pixels will be square. But for a TV input, they will they are actually rectangular. So if you want to properly show the picture on the, in your application, you need to compensate for that. If you do it right, this will be a square. If you do it wrong, it will be a rectangle. And a square, I could have chosen a circle, but actually a square is much easier to measure. Just a ruler against the screen and see, okay, so many millimeters, so many millimeters that way. Works much, much better than trying to prove that a circle is really round. If you have to try that, it sucks. Um, you can also do, uh, so it has support for swapping, as if the sensor would be swapped. And this is then for aspect ratio, but I will discuss that when I switch to, uh, will show the, the TV input. Other things that we have, um, there are sequence counters and timestamps. Whenever you get a frame, you get a sequence counter and a timestamp. But what happens if you leave it running for a really long time and they start wrapping around? Very difficult to test normally, but in this case you can just put in the checkbox and it will be something like 10 seconds or one minute before it wraps. So it's very easy to test whether your application can handle that. Um, you can uh, actually choose how much of the frame is drawn. So if you have large frames then and your CPU isn't that fast, then you can choose to just display, say, 10%. That way the CPU is still going fast enough to do whatever your application has to do. Uh, and you still have a good test case. You can also choose the percentage of buffers that are dropped. So you can see a running counter, if I show the mouse here, in the, in the bottom left corner, there's a running counter. You see the frames per second is now sort of 10, 11, so it's, it's not keeping up at all. And it is because there are 35% dropped buffers. And this allows you to, to test what happens if you have a bad driver or a bad signal and it just keeps on dropping frames. Can your application handle that? There are a whole bunch of other error injection uh, controls here. Um, buff flag error. So it's another good one. So you see the frame rate going down. If I keep pressing this. And what it does is it marks buffers with that flag. What is, if you see a buffer, you capture a buffer with the flag, and that means that, okay, I, I got data, but I'm pretty sure it's corrupt. Skip this frame. But it's not something that happens all that often. Uh, so it's good to be able to test your application. Can it handle that? Does it do the right thing with it? Same with these other, I'm not going to do those days. Those are typically something that will hit when, say, you try to allocate buffers and you can't get the memory. So it's nice to test that. So you can just do the checkbox and then the next time you start streaming, it will fake that error. So it allows you to test all sorts of weird and wonderful corner cases that are next to impossible to do with real hardware. Uh, and of course, there's a disconnect, uh, which is the USB disconnect, effectively. It just, everything, whatever you try to do with the driver, nothing will work anymore. 
until you've closed all the applications and then if you reopen it again, everything will be fine. So this is also a good way to see if your application can handle well the disconnect from a USB device. So I'm, uh, that, that's pretty cool uh, stuff, actually. It's something that didn't exist. It was next to impossible for application writers to test their application on a wide range of hardware with lots of different features. Um, which is probably the reason why, frankly, so many applications are crap. Because they test with the hardware they have. And they're not able to really do a good test sequence. So I can't blame, well, of course I can blame them, but with reservation. I, I understand where they come from. <laughs> so the other one is uh, TV input. And let me see if I can... You should be able to see, um, no, let me make this a bit faster. This should work fine. You see the feathering, right? That's interlacing. I'll stop it, then you can see it really well. But this is typical what you get with, you know, when you have uh, interlaced images and they're moving fast. Again, this is a nice way of testing your deinterlacer in your application. This is work correctly. And this is really, again, this is really specific to remove the border and scroll. This is really specific how, how it really works. So, for example, in PAL and NTSC, which, whether the first line is the oldest frame or the newest frame, is different between the two. And it will actually do the right thing. So it will draw it as it would be in reality. And there are actually a whole bunch of different, uh, I need to stop that, different interlaced formats that are supported by Video for Linux. And this driver supports them all. So again, you can just choose all of them, see if it's, they are supported by your applications. Just the right, just do the right thing for that. Uh, in practice, um, I have to be honest, supporting interlaced formats is sufficient. All the other ones, I don't, I think all the drivers will always have interlaced format. All the other ones are, some drivers have them, others don't, it's hit and miss. So frankly, if you just support that one, that's good enough. So one other thing that I didn't, I, I skipped fairly quickly but there's here a test pattern called CSC color bar. CSC stand for, stands for color space conversion. Uh, let me get rid of the square. And let's stop moving here. So color spaces is it's actually a topic I've been researching quite a bit and I might who knows, perhaps next year I'm back here with a presentation on color spaces. They're quite interesting. Color space basically tells you, so you have red, green, and blue. But what does it mean? What red, what green, and what blue? What color exactly do you mean? That is skipping lots and lots of complexity, but that's effectively what a color space does. It defines which colors are do you mean by red, green, and blue. And it is surprising how much of an effect that has. So you can actually, this driver can generate colors in different color spaces. And if I, so going through them, you see, well, I'm not even sure if you can see that there are almost no difference. Uh, very slight tint changes, but otherwise it seems you wonder what's the, what's the difference here. Uh, well, one thing is that this application is really good, so it actually sees the color space and will compensate for it. But if I turn it from auto detect to just sRGB and try the same thing, then you see quite a big difference in how colors are represented. So this is a very nice tool to test this as well. What does it, so I think lots and lots of uh, applications do not handle color spaces. So they will not actually show the image as it should be shown.
So that's actually a, a very useful tool, and it is something that I'm, so I'm, I'm, I will be adding more color spaces as well, because HDMI formats, HDMI connector, they define a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, so they will be added to the kernel probably this year. So something else that I wanted to show, so anyone know, so this is a PAL, PAL input that I'm emulating. Does anyone know what it is in the top line, top half line? No, not teletext. But close, you're warm. It's uh, it's actually the widescreen signal. So in PAL and CCOM, you can send information in the top half, first half line that tells you whether it's widescreen, four by three, uh, anamorphic widescreen. For inexplicable reason, they decided to do it in the top first video line, the first half of it. I don't know why. So if you ever, you know, in the past it didn't matter because you had overscan, so you had a big border around your your big cathode dupe, and that was hiding it. But now with digital screens, it's visible in full glory. Um, so often if you see, say, someone captured the movie from a VHS or whatever, and you see this fiddly line in the top, that's where it comes from. And this is faithfully reproduced here as well. And so if you're living in the US and you want your application to work in Europe as well, you want to be able to test this and see if you can mask it out by making it black or whatever. Interestingly, for NTSC, uh, th they did define a widescreen signal, but they never implemented it. So whenever you go to the US and you're sitting in your hotel room and you want to watch TV, always everything is stretched. After all, we have a widescreen. I will fill the whole widescreen wide screen up, even if it's a four by three format. So everything looks fat, and the crummy remotes you get in a hotel, they are never able to tell the TV to show it properly. I can't stand it. I hate it. I think it looks horrible. Uh, but they, for whatever reason, it never caught on the widescreen signal. So for analog, analog pro broadcasts in NTSC, it's not available. You have So, let me stop that. So that was color space, let it book back to auto detect. So video aspect ratio, now pixel aspect ratio. So by default it auto detects it. So in this case it's PAL, it sees that it's PAL, so it will compensate for a non-square pixel. If you don't do that, well, this is what you get, so it's no longer square. And uh, one one here. So you can also generate a picture that is 14 by 3 or widescreen, so then everything is letterboxed. And you also have anamorphic widescreen, which is basically widescreen, but everything is squashed, scaled down to 4 by 3, so it needs to be stretched out again. And if you have this on auto, de well actually uh, auto detect will detect whether it's NTSC or PAL, it doesn't detect anamorphic widescreen, but you can so, Paul, so now it should be square again. This is again square. So this is where the square comes in. If you want to test whether you ha can handle that correctly, it's very easy to have this available. Um, this, is, this is a TV tuner, so you be, you're obviously able to tune. So if you get a little bit out of tune, out of the top frequencies, things go to grayscale, the color killer kicks in. And if you go a bit further, then you get noise, static. As you can see, whenever I change the frequency, just like traditional TVs, the pattern changes slightly. And I know this is completely unimportant, but it was fun to do. <laughs> it was just a few lines of code, amazingly short, and it's, it's fun. I'm, I'm just like a normal person who has fun with weird stuff.
So that was TV. So let's do HDMI. Oh, suddenly, oh, I think it's still anamorphic. That's not what we want. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. That's better. So, just set a few things up here. Because what I wanted to show you K, 60 frames per second. So if you want to test your application, uh, by the way, quite amazed that this laptop can do, it's, it's really generating this 60 times per second 4K image scaled down to one quarter by OpenGL. That's pretty impressive for a simple laptop. But if you want to test 4K capture, here it is. This is, this is exactly what it should, well, of course it's not a 4K screen and I don't have a 4K output, but if I would have, then you can use this to test with. And I think this is pretty amazing. And this is also where that uh, slider came in, where you can change the percentage that is filled. I mean, this laptop is pretty good, but I think most ARM systems won't be able to keep up. But then you can say, well, just fill 10% of the image. Uh, and that way you can keep your CPU going fast enough to be able to test whether your application can handle uh, the processing of an image like this. This is actually one of the reasons why this is put in, to be able to test stuff like this. How, do, how else do you do it? So that is useful here uh, as well. You have several, you can go full screen. You can also choose different uh, scalers, OpenGL scalers. You can make snapshots. Scaling is interesting. Let me switch to something uh, not quite as... Let's go uh, just traditional. It also has interlaced formats, by the way. So that's also nice to have HDMI interlaced. Again, it's for, it's for testing to be able... And this, it'll, it just generates it the way it should be, like real hard. I mean, there's no point in making a test driver that doesn't do what the real world is doing. It's like the old Fifi driver, it's pointless. I spend a lot of time on this. Uh, also, this, this supports also uh, vertical blanking information. Very recently, it's actually not yet on, the, on this driver, on this laptop, but very recently I added Teletext. We had a big regression, very late in the, the 317 cycle where it turned out teletext didn't work anymore. So we had two old applications doing teletext and they didn't get, get anything anymore. So I decided, well, well, what the heck, I'm going to add teletext here as well, just to be able to test those tools. And it's useful, we've got a lot of people in the US, they don't have teletext. So if they make changes to a driver, they can't test it. But with this, you can. Uh, not, if it's really in a driver, you can't test it. But if you do something in the core of video for Linux, and that was the case here, and it's nice to be able to test this. Uh, the same with radio. Uh, I mean, there I have a radio transmitter and a radio receiver. And if you put them both to the same frequency, then the transmitter will actually copy everything to the receiver. So fun stuff like that. Just like you have, you know, you have a real receiver and transmitter hooked up to your PC, you would get the same effect. I got wild. Um, the test and the test pattern generator, by the way, very in uh, I, I paid special attention to that, that I wrote it in such a way that it can take that code and use it in an application. And in fact, this test driver also provides a video output. And this should look very familiar because these are pretty much the same controls that were in the Vivid driver, because it's exactly the same code. I just copied the test pattern generator code in the application 
So I can do exactly the same stuff here that I did in the test driver. Uh, and the command line tool, VFL2 CTL, does the same thing. It uses exactly the same code. So that way I don't have to copy it every time and then the things get out of sync. Uh, the, the repository for these test tools has a little script that will actually copy the latest headers and, and stuff from the kernel. So whenever we make changes in the kernel and we want to update the test repository, we can use that, we can use that mechanism. And it will copy these test pattern generator code actually from the kernel into the applications. So they will always be kept in sync and I only have to maintain one place where I do that. And it's actually not that easy to write a good test pattern generator, particularly if you take things like color spaces into account as well. Anything? Two last things. Um, one of them is that this module, uh, the test drive is also very configurable. So initially I come up with a webcam and with a TV input, SVDO, HDMI. You can configure that. You can have eight HDMI inputs if you want. You can have multiple instances of the driver. Um, you can really, what you can do, and that the way it was designed, is that say you have an upcoming product, you're doing an embedded company, you're doing work there, you know you get a new product. Uh, it will have, I don't know, two HDMI inputs, two HDMI outputs. You can configure this driver that it will show itself exactly like your hardware will turn out to be. So you can start writing your application code before the hardware is available, just by correctly configuring this driver so that it will look exactly the way it will look eventually. Not entirely surprising, given my background at Cisco, this is the sort of thing we want to do. So one very final, oh, things can get really hairy because this driver also supports not just capturing, but also cropping and composing and scaling. So this is one workflow that you can have where you have an HDMI input, you crop part of that input, then you scale that part up to a buffer that, or to, you scale, you scale it up. Then you compose that into a still larger buffer. And then you show the whole thing in OpenGL. So you get lots of scalars going on and cropping and composing. This driver supports cropping and composing both on inputs and outputs. Uh, you can loop video from an input and an output. That's what I wanted to show. It is getting hairy. This is my input. My output. Um, oh. So the first thing I need to do on the output side is there's a loop video checkbox, so I need to set that. And we're just doing uh, as video inputs, let's make it simple. Right, so now I have established a loop from this output driver to the input driver. And I can crop things. It is flickering here, as you can see. If I make changes here, it goes green. And that's, a, I think I'm having a two cores of a lock in the test driver. It's not a problem, but I need to optimize that. I'm not sure that's what is happening. I haven't looked at it. Would be nice to have that fixed. Oh, test pattern. Let's let's have some movement here. So this is all generated by the output device. It's looped internally to the input device, and it's doing uh, cropping and it can do scaling on different sides. So if you if you have if you want to test all the combinations, you really need to have a flowchart because it gets very confusing very quickly. But again, this is exactly how the hardware will work. 
This is how it's, how it's done. Uh, and this is also, by the way, uh, there's often been a request for a loop, loopback driver. Uh, there exists one or two out of kernel drivers to do loopback, but people never wanted it in the kernel. I think the, reason, the main reason for that is that they were afraid that it would be abused. Um, but effectively, this is now in the kernel, and this can act like a loopback driver. You just need to set it up correctly. And that is pretty much what I wanted to show. So I have one last slide with all the resources. I, this will be posted later, so you can, uh, can read that. I had a nice, there we are. Questions? Yep. Uh, yes, Mo, let me close this. So, oh, sorry. There we go. SDR. So this emulates what you would get. Uh, it looks a bit odd. Why this? I'm not sure why this looks uh, this looks somewhat peculiar. Am I doing scaling? Oh, whatever, I need to double check that. But this is supposed to be uh, two waveforms, two sign waveforms, one for each component in a uh, SDR uh, software defined radio. Unfortunately, there is a bug there, it's not a perfect sine wave. There is a bug in the sine calculation where it just does weird stuff. I'm a bit surprised that it looks like this, that shouldn't happen. Uh, but it can be used, it's been used for testing with GNU radio and it works. Yeah, two sine waves. Uh, it's, it's acting peculiar. Not sure, something looks weird. Oh, need to look at it. But this could, can be used for testing for software-defined radio. You suppose this, this can be used for software-defined radio testing. You should get a nice one, I think it's a 1000 hertz beep out of it. If it wasn't for the fact that it's not a perfect sine wave. <laughs> So you want you think it would be good to have something what happens when there is no input anymore, no new no new frames being produced. Well, that's, that's where the error uh, injection comes in. So this sets basically percentage of drop buffers onto the end. They all generate specific errors. Yeah, all of this uh, SNH feature for, for 
Yeah. With FIFA 2 CTL, you can just select controls and, and, and trigger them, no problem. Or you can write a small application that does that. It's, it's just setting a control. So. About the buff flag error, what's the point of this flag? What's the point of giving you space and buffer that is already flagged? Um, it can be several reasons. Sometimes it is that the driver just has to has to output. It. It's not able to recycle the buffer internally. Uh, it can also be useful to uh, for detecting dropped buffers because this buffer is not dropped. If you get a buffer, it's just weird stuff. Sometimes you have drivers where the first one or two buffers are corrupt, so the hardware doesn't give you valid data for whatever reason. There can be many reasons for that. Some drivers will do that correctly. Some drivers will just say, hey, there's something wrong here. I set the flag and throw it out. So it can be laziness from the, uh, from the programmer. Um, it doesn't happen often. Most drivers want to use it. But the ones that I've seen are usually USB drivers that do something funny. And then you will see this, uh, this flag. But you should be able to handle it. It's part of the spec, uh, so it's good to have a way of generating these and see if your application keeps behaving as it should. Okay, no more questions. Thank you very much.